Right, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me now. This is me, my, my wee mug here. I'm Dr. Doyle, and, and I'm a uh, uh, 1997 graduate of OHSU here in Oregon. That's where we're at right now. And I'm an instructor for the dental um, implant camp uh, we hold here, live surgical camps uh, at, our, at our office here in Oregon. I'm an associate fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry. I'm a maxi course uh, here in Oregon. Um, it's now called the Oregon Implant Continuum. I helped uh, TA there, and I'm also a CIRAC mentor, so I do enjoy uh, participating with the CIRAC. So uh, this is our camp. Um, we, we hold those about uh, four times a year. Uh, patients are screened ahead of time um, for the doctors to perform surgeries on. So it's one of the things we really enjoy. This is our team. We have quite a big team in our office. Um, um, so we've, uh, we, we, we aren't, we aren't uh, suffering for not being busy. We're very busy. And uh, a couple of uh, disclosures. Um, I do lecture oftentimes for Implant Direct. Um, some of the sponsors for some of our courses is Maxius, Dental Loss, Degenics, uh, Cytoplast, uh, BioHorizon, also Patterson and uh, Densply Serona. So those are some of my disclosures as far as uh, any conflict of interest. Or... But uh, today we're talking about selecting an implant system. And part of our objectives today are to understand what, um, what implant design qualities are important for in selecting an implant system. You know, for, for me, trying to de determine which system I would start to use or, and, and over the, the years, um, it's placing multiple different kinds of implants, you kind of can't keep having so many different types of implants. So um, looking at the qualities that are important in selecting an implant system, and discovering a systematic approach for selecting an implant system without company bias. So we know that there's always bias out there with everybody. And of course, we're lecturing for implant direct. So, but I try to avoid some of that in the future, and you'll see what we're talking about here. And understand how systems can be interchanged to take advantage of their qualities. Not all of them can, some of them can. Uh, so we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, first off, osteo integration. And if you all know, you all should know this probably. And, and this is uh, Brandon Mark, and he was doing some experiments on some, uh, some bunnies and uh, looking at, at how bone uh, turned over, how it grew. And what he discovered is when he tried to remove this, uh, this rod, it didn't come out. Um, what happened was it was made of titanium. And so they discovered this, this, this thing called, they called it osteointegration, which they describe now as a direct contact uh, connection between living bone and load carrying osseous implants at the light microscopic level. That sounds a uh, very uh, big mouthful, but what we're talking about is, is this idea that the um, implants uh, and the bone actually integrate together. So looking at all these different choices we have uh, of different implant systems, um, with all the different surfaces there are, that are on there, which one's the best, what's most important? And, and when we look at them all, what we found is that despite the differences in texture, chemistry, and all implant surfaces were biocompatible and osteoconductive and led to a comparable in vivo bone fixation, similar microscopic bone re response. So that means is that they all seem to be uh, integrating. And so what what's really important about those surfaces, so all these different surfaces we have here, what was important is down on this microscopic level, down here at one micron, what's happening is the osteocytes are now on the surface, while the dendritic, dendritic processes have now uh, moved into those one uh, micron um, uh, holes in the surface of the implant. And that's the important part, is that the surfaces have to have some kind of a way for the osteocytes to uh, cling onto the implant. This little one micron is, is the key in there. So without that, you don't get the same kind of osteointegration that we, we would expect. Uh, so that's what we discovered over time. So as these, these cells, what happens when you go in and drill on, a, on, on bone and place your implant, we disrupt the osteos, osteocytes and they will give out a signal. And they send a signal, a stress signal out saying, okay, something's happened here, you need to now turn, turn the, boat, the body over. And when that happens, you need to remodel the bone. It, it occurs at 10 times faster than normal physiologic turnover. 
So what that means is when it begins to turn over, the first thing it begins to do, like when you're remodeling a home, you begin destroying it first. You got to move, take some walls down before you start to build walls back up. So it begins dissolving the bone around the implant. We all know that os the osteoclasts begin doing that. And that's why at about the three to six weeks after placement, the, um, imp the implant is the weakest because of this osteoclastic activity during bone repair. So the osteoblasts come in, they turn over into osteocytes and begin to, to lay down the bone. Woven bone forms at the rate of about 60 microns per day, while lamellar bone, it, it, that mature bone, uh, forms at about one to five microns per day. By the end of about four months, the osteoblasts and the bone next to an implant have deposited about 70% of the mineral found in, in mature vital bone. So that can happen pretty quick because the woven bone is doing that. And so, uh, what we're trying to do is figure out this problem. And this problem is the stability dip. What happens when you place an implant is you get what's called primary stability, it's a mechanical stability. But because of the osteoclastic activity, it begins to drop. Luckily, we also have osteointegration occurring, which is biologic stability. And that begins to build the bone back up. And that dip between primary mechanical loss, stability loss, and the biologic stability that's being gained is what we call the stability dip. It happens between three to six weeks. It's just what the body does. And, and trying to, to change that isn't going to happen. But what we found is that, um, again, this is the three to six week mark. What we found, though, is that sometimes the body's response isn't as good. And so despite the different textures, what is it about the patient's biology that influences the secondary stability? And that is more important than the surface. All these surfaces we have right now that have the one micron holes for the, the osteocytes to cling onto, those uh, are not, that's important, but what's really important, what makes the difference oftentimes is the patient's biology. Um, it influences the second state, second, um, secondary stability more than the implant surface itself. So when we have those patients that are taking, um, you know, some rheumatoid arthritis and are taking some medications for that, or they have uh, um, other medications, a lot of medications they have that, that they can take um, can reduce their osteointegration, some uh, SSRIs, some, all, some of those, uh, those uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, a lot of these medications can, can change how the biology um, uh, responds. So that's really the most important part. And so in looking at what implants uh, integrate, they all do. So one of the things we want to talk about is, is some of the terminology about implants. First of all, we have the body, you know, uh, the body diameter. We have the body length. And so oftentimes when we look at an implant and we talk about it, we'll talk about a 4.3 by 13. That's looking at the body diameter and the length of the body. We also have some of these threads in here, like in this case, uh, mini threads or micro threads and micro grooves. And in this case, because of the, of the orientation, uh, this is describing an interactive uh, implant. So that's how we start talking about a, a implant is that kind of uh, the, bo the body diameter, the body length, and the kind of implant that is. We also have the platform with a prosthetic connection. And that, that could be different, oftentimes different than the body diameter. And like in this case, in this interactive, the, body dam the platform is a 3.4, which allows us to have what's called a platform switch. And so that platform difference between the body diameter and the platform um, gives you the platform switching. There's also a bevel in this case that, um, that goes from the body diameter up to the platform. We'll talk a little bit more about all these things, but I wanted to get you familiar with some of the terminology before we jump into everything else. So as we move forward, we're looking at all these different platforms that we have, and how do we determine which platform we want, why we want it, and what's important to us? We also have all the body types. You know, what body, what characteristics do we want in our implants uh, for our our own uh, uh, patients as we as we give uh, as we give this service to the patients? What is best going to serve us? And obviously, we're not going to. Hopefully, we're not going to go buy all the implants and all the different types and place them all, it's just, it's too chaotic. And trying to restore all those, we can't do that. So at some point we have to decide, 
as doctors which implant system we're going to go with. And, and you kind of go that way and hopefully you stick with it for a long time because uh, you now have to restore all these things. And so unless you're a specialist where you're having to cater to your different implants, uh, your implants to your different doctors, if you're restoring and, and placing and restoring your own, you are going to limit yourself probably to a few different ones. So we'll talk about that this right now, but the implant designs. So what I did, this is how I approached uh, trying to figure out what I wanted in my implants. And so looking at the body design, do I want tapered or do I want straight? Uh, do I want bone level or do I want tissue level? Do I want deep threads, very aggressive threads, or do I want non-aggressive threads? How about mini threads or those micro grooves at the top at the crest versus deep crestal threads going all the way up to the top of the crest? Do I want that? Which and why would I want um, one over the other? Then I have the implant platform design. What kind of platform design do I want? Do I want external or internal connection? Do I want a flat platform or a bevel lead-in? We're going to talk more about this. Do I want platform switched or non-platform switched? So these are the questions I started looking at. To me, okay, what am I going to get? What, what, what do I want? What's important to me? And how am I going to decide which is, which is the implant system I'm going to stick with? So this is where I went to. So the first thing I decided was, okay, with my implant body design, I wanted to get a taper. And I'll, uh, and I'll start eliminating, without any bias up here on the right-hand side, I'll start eliminating some of these implants um, as we go along and make decisions about our decision tree about which implant system we're going to go with. So uh, first tapered, what we have the difference here is in the straight, obviously there's a difference in how uh, and when they create stress on the bone. Tapered implants have, a, re, have reduced stress during insertion. So as it goes in, um, the tapered implants don't even don't do much touching until they get part way down, then they begin to engage. And that also creates a higher torque when they're completely seated versus touch, going through a straight uh, and engaging the entire way through. So another advantage to it is if you're doing sinus bumps or sinus, you know, sinus lifts, um, a tapered implant lowers the chances of dislodging into the sinuses compared to a straight walled implants. And so that's something I consider too when I'm placing, when I'm doing um, a sinus bump or a, a lateral sinus lift and placing my implants, I want to make sure it's a tapered implant so I'm not uh, increasing my risk of, of losing that implant into the sinus. This is just an example of, of, of that kind of small taper we get. And sometimes you have to be careful because some, act, some tapered implants actually have a, they return back at the top and they actually become more narrow at the top. So if you're not careful, uh, what you think is a taper may actually um, end up being a problem when you uh, insert it in a, a very narrow, uh, bone uh, uh, for going from crestal to to uh, um, to apical. So in this case, um, talking about apex, right near uh, other other teeth, one of the things we have with with tapered implants is that we can uh, get them in areas that otherwise may be difficult. So like in this case, we're placing a, a a tapered implant versus a straight implant. Um, that straight implant just that that small a difference. Uh, now creates a problem with us. And so uh, having a tapered implant around adjacent teeth helps us to avoid the adjacent teeth a little bit. So that can be very helpful. It's also helpful when I'm placing implants. If I have low torque, I can actually uh, drill a little bit deeper and my versus a straight, I can drill a little bit deeper and my because a taper uh, is there, I can insert that that implant a little bit deeper and that actually will give me the torque I need uh, for st uh, stability uh, immediately versus a straight. If I don't have um, much of a uh, of stability, it's difficult to get that apex to give you the, the torque value you need for good stability. Anyway, so I guess that's tapered. So I've decided I want a tapered implant. Do I want bone level versus tissue level? Well, there's some advantages. I've chosen bone level. I'll give you some, some reasons why. Um, again, your options for collar heights. You have to make sure that if you want a collar height, part of the, the advantage to having a tissue level is that you don't have that interface. Um, but you also have to discern, determine ahead of time what tissue height you're going to want and may have to carry the different, different uh, heights. 
one of the things we talk about too is that the advantage of it is the butt joint with polished collar is that you don't have that interface right next to the bone. And so you don't have that micro gap. It's ideal for eliminating uh, butman implant margins near the bone. Whereas the uh, a butt joint with rough collar has that, that micro gap right near the bone and can, can cause some uh, bone loss. But one of the problems we have, if we do insert that uh, tissue collar um, deeper, we will get some bone loss there because that area, the, pol the polished collar won't integrate. It won't um, integrate to the implant or into the bone. So you get some bone loss there as well. The other problem we end up having is, um, is this aesthetic concerns and emergence issues. So oftentimes if you do choose to use a, um, a tissue level uh, implant, you have to make care, may have to carry other implants as well in case in situations where you have a, a tissue concern or emergence con uh, emergent uh, issues as well. So that's one of the problems I wanted to avoid was having to deal with with this kind of uh, emergence and uh, aesthetic concerns. So I chose to go with bone level. How about deep threads, very aggressive threads versus non-aggressive threads? So I'm sticking with the deep threads, and I'll talk about what that looks like. Again, eliminating some of our of our uh, implant systems. I chose to keep one so we can look at it later. Deep threads increase the primary stability in areas of poor bone quality compared to non-aggressive threads. So um, again, we want to get that that your versatility in in poor poorer <laughs> quality of bone, um, but we also need to look at very aggressive threads. Can lead um, can create unfavorable stress in dense bone. So again, uh, this kind of system with very aggressive threads uh, can be a, a more of a problem uh, when you go to dense bone. Uh, and so uh, it's very great. It's, it's great around D4 bone, but now you have to have carry a different implant for um, for different density of bone. So I like to have one in the middle that's aggressive threads, but not so aggressive that it causes a problem in, in the more dense bone. Also, when you have a very aggressive threads that are end cutting, they can deviate from the osteotomy during insertion. So like uh, this implant was designed so that if you kind of messed up your osteotomy, you can correct it during insertion. If that's important to you, maybe you want to go with the end cutting um, implant. Uh, I want to avoid it, um, and I'll show you some other reasons why uh, in, in the future why I avoided an in cutting uh, implant. Um, so I don't have that problem when I'm placing my implant. I want it to interact with the osteotomy that I've created rather than deviate during the placement. So I've gone with the deep threads versus uh, very aggressive and non aggressive threads. So deep threads, and then also what I want is looking at mini threads, the crest versus deep. Uh, crestal threads. I don't want my deep crestal threads at the very top, and so I've gone with mini threads. So even though it's aggressive at the bottom, it transitions to mini threads at the top, or micro threads, or micro grooves, however you want to you want to, to label those things. So looking at it, what we find is that deeper threads that extend to the crest increase the stress at the cortical bone level during insertion, and unfavorable a soft tissue transition. So at the very top there. You don't have this transition to crestal bone and the soft tissue that oftentimes will be uh, against that area. And so uh, with micro threads um, or mini threads and micro grooves, it reduces the stress at the cortical bone, especially if you use like a cortical bone drill and, and alleviate that so it's not creating that kind of pressure. And it also increases axial stiffness of the implant and decreases the shear stress. And I'll, look, I'll show it to you later under another subject when we're looking at how that changes the stiffness and the, um, the shear stresses on the uh, bone when you have uh, micro grooves and thicker, thicker metal uh, of the implant at the, at the neck like that. So micro grooves also promote adhesion of the gingival fibroblasts. So rather than having quick loss of, of bone, it allows the, the, uh, the fibroblasts and the osteoblastic cells um, uh, run peri-implant soft tissue to seal that, that area up there. So at the top where the implant uh, and the soft tissue now um, have an interaction. So the next 
one is so I have right now I have a tapered implant, bone level, deep threads with with mini or micro threads or micro grooves at the top. That's my body design. Now looking at platform design, do I want external or internal connection? Well, there's some some evidence that internal connection is more favorable in, in many ways. And and one of the things we look at is just the screw loosening. There's a 57% um, screw loosening with external implant connections, where with internal implant, implant connections, this is external, of course, with internal implant connection, it's only 6% screw loosening. So much less screw loosening with internal implant connection. And there's some physics of why this happens. Um, again, screw loosening, you, can, you increase bone loss and screw breakage. And uh, like last week, I was just had to replace somebody's implant that had external hex, and it was, it was a good challenge for them. This is a, a, um, from Ziprich in, in Germany. They did some great studies and great examples uh, looking at the this micro gaps near the bone with, uh, with can, these internal connections being smaller than external connections. So as you have this lateral forces, the gap is smaller on internal internal connections versus external connections. So you're going to have more bone loss just because of the way that the internal connection versus external connection um, uh, inter, uh, react to uh, lateral forces. This is what it looks like, and this is why it's important, is that during that chewing or mastication and lateral forces being created, you have this micro gap and this kind of pumping action that occurs. And what's in that material, in that solution that's being uh, pumped oftentimes is bacteria. And so we got this bacteria that's being pumped and being um, growing in those micro gaps, um, allowing uh, inflammation and bone loss around that micro gaps. And that's part of why we have this um, micro, this, um, this bone loss around that gap between the implant and the abutment. And so one of the things we can do is, is reduce that by having internal connection that reduces that lateral forces, um, uh, creating a micro gap. Also looking at flat for, platform versus bevel lead in. So one of the next things we can look at is with an internal connection, having it a bevel lead in versus it being a flat platform. What we get is we get far less last deformation um, and the, when the bevel lead in um, has, a little, has a little gap formation at all compared to flat. And so by having an internal connection that has a, a, lead, a, a lead bevel, a bevel inside, um, we get less gap formation. And so now we have that uh, creating less of a problem than if it was a flat. One of the things uh, that look, we look, look at too is, is how that lead bevel uh, resists the lateral forces. And it's, it's, a, it's a component of um, what it looks like inside. And this is looking back at um, having micro threads versus having deeper grooves going all the way to the top. You have this thinning of the, bone, of the uh, metal uh, when you have an internal connection around those um, deep, deep, those deeper grooves. To create those deeper grooves, you have to remove some metal in that area. So the micro grooves also help with the stiffness of the implant at the, at the crestal area, which also reduces bone loss. So that's one of the things you want to look at too, is that uh, advantages as well, sorry, of uh, many threads at the uh, crestal area and having a internal um, bevel. So now we have a internal connection, the, uh, the bevel lead in. We want platform switched or non-platform switched. So I'm, I wanted to go with platform switch. We've seen a lot of, of uh, studies lately that show that um, having a platform switch um, brings that gap, if whatever gap is formed, away from the bone, um, also reducing the effect of that micro gap on the bone. And so um, when we're seeing this uh, deformation, you very see very little um, uh, gap formation uh, around a platform spit switch, but where you do, it's further away from the bone. So when we place our implants, uh, polished collar, subgingival on accident or on purpose, um, we get that bone loss. Also with a, a butt joint, with a rough collar, with that, uh, that abutment and implant connection there, we get also bone loss. When we 
pull that micro that micro gap away from the uh, the bone, we see less bone loss. What's interestingly what's interesting enough is if you then place these platform switch subcrestal, you get another advantage is that it has even less bone loss because of the um, reduction of the stresses at the neck of the of the implant um, on the bone. And so because it's subcrestal, that bone above it uh, has less effect on it. So these are some examples, this is just one example of uh, countersinking the implant a little bit. One of the problems I've had in the past when I didn't countersink is I ended up with this uh, kind of uh, um, pumpkin on a stick kind of scenario versus having uh, submerged my implant slightly and I get a better response. And, and these kind of uh, results of what I really like long term, this bone stays a lot better when it's submerged um, and a platform switched. So this is one of the advantages I'm seeing when I have a platform switch um, is when I'm submerging it slightly. And also it has this, uh, this bevel right here on the outside, uh, down on the, on the bottom uh, example. Um, you have that, that difference there. And as you submerge that implant, that little bevel allows you to still have your platform at the same level as the implant, as the bone, but this little bevel there uh, reduces some of that stress on the, on the, uh, on the, on the bone. So now we have our, our implants that we've eliminated and kept what we, what we want as far as our different characteristics. And now we can look at what are these implants? We've got some of the still leaders in the, in, out there. So I looked at, well, how do I decide between these guys? What, do I, what am I going to decide between? And one of the things we came, I looked at too was what's called commercial per titanium. It has, a, it has a tensile strength of about 240 to 550 megapascals. Titanium alloy has a tensile strength of about 860 to 900, so much stronger um, metal. Um, and so I wanted to know, well, what's the advantage there? The tensile strength becomes more important factor the more narrow the implant. The smaller the implant, um, the more important that this factor becomes so you won't get flowering during placement or a problem during, um, during mastication over a long period of time. So commercial titanium implants require weaker screws to avoid internal threads. In the past, um, we used to have to use a gold screw um, inside the implant uh, to create the right kind of um, uh, elasticity of the, of the metal uh, and, and, uh, and pre preload. Um, with titanium alloy implants, experience less internal thread deformation at higher torque, permitting stronger screws. So, you can put a stronger screw inside of the uh, titanium alloy implants. The new diamond-like carbon coating, though, uh, they have they come out with this uh, uh, that allows higher torque values. Um, so that's something that that's uh, interesting too. Is this new coating on some of the, uh, the the screws that have helped higher torque values to be maintained to be experienced. One thing we have to make sure we know about is that um, there are implants that are outside of this titanium alloy that are titanium zirconium alloy. Um, and one of the manufacturers reports about a nine, uh, 950 megapascals. In the past, it was limited to um, uh, smaller implants only. Now they've kind of expanded it and it has this kind of larger rock solid um, uh, Strauman implant that's, that's very aggressive, but it has that stronger uh, material um, with this, the, the tie zirconium. Alloy, but for for now we're going to stick with looking at just the tight the titanium alloy versus commercial pure. So it let, lets me kind of make a decision now. I can get these stronger implants, uh, less likely to flower on me during placement. Um, allows me to have stronger a strong a screw, more robust uh, um, abutments or multi-unit abutments that I might place on these. And and what we have is these three different um, companies now. What's interesting about these three companies is that they have these three examples uh, have the same bevel lead in, except for the interactive. The interactive has a deeper bevel. It's the same uh, uh, restorative platform as a active implant, the, no, the noble active, which is the conical connection. So this one has the conical connection. These have the, the, um, the less deep or the more shallow um, 
a bevel, which is what we're looking at right here. When we have a shallow bevel, the forces are a little different. So right here uh, in the legacy system, we have a, a shallower bevel, um, which is very good to have that bevel lead in. But when we go deeper, the forces change and we have uh, a more of a lateral force uh, uh, stability um, with that uh, deeper uh, lead in bevel. So the force is uh, very, uh, very favorable when it's a deeper implant, uh, deeper lead bevel in. So on the legacy um, with this bevel, um, you have seven body sizes and, uh, but, and four platforms, but only three platform switches. And of course you can't get a, three, a platform switch with a 3.2 because it's already so small. But when we're going down to the larger sizes, the platform switches are the 4.2, the 5.2, and the 7. So for me, when I'm looking at a platform switch, I, I, was looked, I looked at, uh, at this and said, okay, so those are the four that I have, or three that I have that are platform switched. The advantage also is that in, in the system, the drivers um, for these, there's three drivers because um, the 2.5 driver uh, fits the, um, the 3.5 and the 4.5 uh, platforms. And so um, that's a little advantage there as well. But comparing this, the legacy to the interactive, um, what we find here is only four body sizes with two platforms. Uh, of course, to me, that reduces my, my um, inventory at my office, which I like. And then, but this one has three platform switches. Of course, again, we can't really have a platform switch to the 3.2 because it's too, it's too narrow already. But 3.7, the 4.3, and the 5.0 all have platform switches, which I, I like. I appreciate that. So I want that platform switch. And this is why this has been, I, I've looked at this, and this is, for me, a really good option for fulfilling all my requirements. In this, again, we have the 2.3 and the 2.7 hex drivers. So for the smaller, um, the smaller uh, diameter platforms, um, we have a 2.3, and for the larger diameters, we have the uh, 2.7. One of the things that I do, though, is I do have to admit that, that um, every once in a while, I'll have a rescue implant uh, from the legacy that I'll pull out, and this is for rescuing situations where we have a implant that failed or had a problem, and rather than um, terminating it, we can actually replace that implant with a rescue implant, that's what I call it, the 7.0 uh, legacy that has a platform switch. And so this has been really nice to have that option and be able to, to, uh, to do that. So these are kind of the, the, my bread and butter right here of my implants. I wanted to compare the Noble Active to the Implant Direct the, um, Interactive because they have the, very same, they have the same conical connection. And what's interesting to me, besides the screws that are, that are in them, um, is the end cutting. So the active cutting ape has a cutting apex. It's designed to actively, actively diverge from the path created by the drills. So the cutting apex, however, though, increases the um, risks of the sinuses, the IA nerve, or the, and the path uh, devi deviation. So it's made to deviate. But when you're near a sinus and you don't want to tear through it, or you're near an IA nerve or, or something that you're concerned about, um, it does concern me having an end cutting um, uh, implant rather than a non-cutting implant. In this case, the interactive interacts with the osteotomy that was prepared um, following the drill path. Um, it also reduces, the non-cutting reduces the apex risks, uh, like the IA nerve, the sinuses, and, and it doesn't deviate from the path of insertion um, like you would get with the end cutting. So this is part of what comparing these two. We also did, What's interesting to me is, if you all know, is that Danaher uh, has ownership of both of those, which now they've, they've turned into Invista. And so Invista is the ownership of both of those implants. And so for me, when I look at these systems, they have the, the same dimensions and manuf manufacturing tolerances. So I know that when I'm placing an implant, I can, I can be comfortable with what these two uh, conical connections have because I'm not. I'm not getting a, a knockoff brand from China or whatever you want to 
go to, I'm getting something that has the same tolerances. So what we've done is the difference though, again, is to me is the commercial titanium versus the titanium alloy, the stronger implant. So in cases where we're doing, I've done lots of uh, that's all ons, um, my system currently is I still use my Nobel um, drills, my Nobel mounts to perform my, uh, my osteotomies and my surgery, but I'm placing my implant uh, interactive uh, implants from Implant Direct. So this is what the surgery looks like. Um, where you still, again, we're using all the drills and the guides and the keys and the mounts from Nobel, um, but we're placing our, our conical connection uh, implant direct drills that are uh, non in-cutting and have a, have a stronger titanium alloy. Yeah, and these are mounts for a Nobel, but it is very similar uh, lengths and sizes as the um, Nobel Active, but with all the um, characteristics that I want in my input. With Ford Fest. At this point, at this point, we were using the same um, material, the same um, multi abutments, and uh, the, um, the titanium uh, cylinders uh, from Nobel, um, and we have uh, great outcomes. Now, I'm, I'm pretty much using once I've gone with the drills and the um, and the uh, mounts, as I've done the surgery, I'm now placing um, everything. Uh, implant direct because I found the actual um, cylinders, multi abutments, and the screws to be much more robust and stronger than what I've been finding with Nobel um, BioCare. So I transitioned everything over uh, as far as restorative as well to uh, my implant direct materials because of the strength. So one of the things that um, I wanted to make sure I hit is is that um, when I'm placing my implant direct uh, drill uh, drills, I use CIRAC oftentimes, and um, I needed to find guide keys that fit my CIRAC. So we created our own um, line of uh, implant uh, keys to fit the no the implant direct drills when we're doing our, our implant uh, single guided versus the full mouth guides like we did for the the all ons. When we do single implants and we're doing a CIRAC guide, I needed some kind of I needed something to fit my implant direct um, drills. So I know that um, August de Oliveira has their has his straight keys, and and I had a hard time using those in the patient's mouth, um, in, especially in the posterior. So when we developed our 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 keys, we developed them so that they could fit in the posterior more easily. And this is an example. So we teach our courses. This is one of the things we we do as well is as, uh, as we use the CIRAC guides and our keys to uh, place the implants and doctors are learning how to do guided surgery uh, using the same the same keys so this is why we, we, we created them so that this uh posterior if you look right here the way the lip is sitting around that uh, that osteotomy preparation uh, and into the into the guide does it pinch the patient's lip. That's the thing I always have in the posterior patients aren't hurting about that. What they recommended a, uh, a CIRAC was to cut off the, the keys and hold them in there with hemostats. And I thought that was not what I wanted to do. So we created our own uh, implant keys. Anyway, so whew, that was fast. <laughs> I don't have the interaction of everybody talking yet. So um, that was our that this is our course that uh, we teach. Um, uh, the next of course is our November uh, and April. Uh, and if you're interested, um, there's our QR code. And this is my email. If you have any questions that you uh, want me to answer, uh, I'd be f feel free to, to text or e email me and I'd be glad to answer your questions. Uh, can you please review again the advantages of the bevel on implant on implant again? So the question is about um, the advantages of a bevel bevel lead and basically what that's doing is, as you have lateral forces, 
it allows you to mitigate those lateral forces um, with that bevel lead-in versus having a flat platform and all the forces being rocked back and forth on top of it. So that lead, that bevel lead-in with it being a little deeper allows more of that, the forces being mitigated by that uh, deep lead-in. Um, and email back up. How do you move, how do you re to remove implants? Is better? Um, can you please, okay, I'm sorry guys, I'm reading it. How can you, how to remove, remove movable implants? It is better to use forceps or key for implants. So I guess I've showed um, uh, removing a, an implant that had failed. Basically, once you have uh, tissue around an implant, um, it's, you can just put a driver in it and in reverse and back it back out, like a torque wrench in reverse and back it back out, it comes right out. Typically when you have uh, tissue around the whole implant. Otherwise, um, I've had to trefline implants before. And in fact, I have a whole course we taught uh, up at um, Washington about uh, complications. And um, uh, part of it is removing the implants. Uh, it can be a, a good challenge. Um, but trefining around it sometimes if you need to, using a luxator sometimes, but oftentimes uh, using higher forces to back it out. That is, again, what, for me, one of the advantages of a stronger titanium alloy is that um, it resists the flowering and the breaking that occurs if you're trying to back out an implant um, that is a softer material. Oftentimes it'll just break the implant. And there are some kits out there designed to help remove them. Um, and this is my question is, can you put your email back up? Again, there we go. So it's Dr. DRD at newsmiles.com. That's our office here in Oregon. And um, again, if anybody's interested in doing uh, guided surgery, um, this is the code. You can just use your, use your phone and it will help you um, move over to a website there. But our, our, web, our uh, course is dentalimplantcamp.com. Uh, um, if you're interested in, in learning about uh, guided surgery, um, and we use the, uh, the interactive implants for that. Go back to questions, if we have questions still. Um, do I always use surgical guides? I don't. Um, I like to most often because I look at it from a point of view of planning my, my prosthetic first. So I plan my prosthetic through um, through doing a uh, intraoral scan, so doing a um, a digital impression, and then plan my my implant or implants uh, according to the um, digital wax up, and so then I can plan my implants exactly where I want them and have a guide uh, printed or um, or milled or sent off to a lab to have them make it, and um, I know that when I'm finished, I have uh, placed my 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 guide, uh, my implants in the place for my prosthetics. So for me, a guide is prosthetically driven uh, surgery. Um, oftentimes when I'm doing it freehand, um, I will oftentimes do immediates that way. Meaning that uh, if I take a single implant, especially anteriors, implant uh, or tooth out, and I can see on the CBCT where the, imp the, where the tooth root is, I can then guide where my, um, my osteotomy goes according to where I want my implant. And it's easier for me to get to that point um, when I have uh, the root uh, missing and I'm halfway down already the osteotomy because of the, the missing, a missing tooth. So I don't always use guides, um, but I do very often use guides because it's, to me it's so easy uh, to create a guide. For me, it takes uh, five minutes for me to create the guide, to plan the guide, and then we mill it. And unfortunately, the mill takes about 45 minutes to mill, but then I have a guide. So when the surgery occurs, the, the, the advantage to me, besides it being prosthetically driven, is uh, the, the speed that I um, use my, I place my implants. Um, it makes the surgery go much faster um, for the patient and myself. Um, one of my, I, I was filming one of my surgeries and I just went through the process. I was trying to speed, go fast. I was just trying to, just being methodical. And we finished the surgery and it was 12 minutes. The whole surgery from an anesthesia to um, flap to uh, implant osteotomy, implant placement, uh, suturing, all that was uh, 12 minutes. Um, 
it's not a wreck. It's not, I don't, I'm not trying to, but it just makes that whole thing more simple. And um, so that's, that's part of the reason why I like having it um, guided. Uh, one of the questions is, could you show the slide that goes over the various parts of an implant? You bet. Different names here, different names for the micro grooves, micro threads, yeah, different names for them. Um, so they may call it something different, laser lock or something like that as well. Um, platform, prosthetic connection. And these are the bevels. So that's that should be the all the different names uh, for the implants. If you want to take a screenshot, you're welcome to. So this represents basically my uh, decision tree in how I went about deciding what implants uh, I like. I was very happy when uh, Implant Direct switched over to um, the non, um, the, uh, the uh, without the mounts, non-mounted. So the simply interactive without the mounts. I I, I never use the mounts. I, I never. I always like placing my implants, especially if I'm doing the all-on cases. Um, I wanted to attach my um, Nobel my Nobel active um, mounts on there. I had to, what I had to do before is just take off the mount from the, uh, the interactive and toss it and then put my mount for the, um, the Nobel uh, kit on there. So I just, I was just tossing those, those, uh, those mounts. So when they came out with the simply interactive, I was extremely happy. So thank you guys for doing that because that was great for me. Um, this gives me a better option for me at least. All right. So I guess some of you do use Blue Sky, Blue Sky Plan. Um, again, I do. Uh, if I'm printing, I, I use Blue Sky Plan if I'm doing multiple um, implants, uh, and I need to plan uh, multiple sites because the CIRAC currently only lets you mill uh, one site. So, so if I'm doing multiple, I'll scan it, convert it into a STL file, and then um, run it through Blue Sky Plan. And uh, I choose my own sizes because our, um, our keys uh, aren't on their library, of course. And so um, we have to create our own. So they also have, Blue Sky does come with the CIRAC sleeves. So sleeves for the CIRAC uh, sizes. So they fit in there. So they're very um, versatile, the Blue Sky. So Blue Sky Bio is a good little company for us to, to be able to do that. Do I always use a CBCT? I do. I always use a CBCT. Um, part of my opinion about that is um, there was a case here in Oregon where one of the doctors was um, sanctioned for not using CBCT um, in his uh, in his case, and um, the argument against it was, well, then you can't sanction a doctor um, for providing care that is uh, you're, you're basically making that the new standard of care if you require a CBCT. So for me, I always use it. I have one. Um, we have them in our um, our satellite practices as well. Um, so we have the CBCT in all those locations, both locations. And um, I wouldn't I wouldn't place I wouldn't do implants at this level at this stage without um, a CBCT. I think you want to know where, where your, um, your thickness is, you want to know where your bone is, you want to know where, you know, bone is the, the key to it all. So placing a, an implant um, without all that knowledge um, can, be, can be harder. Uh, in the past, you know, when we were you know, years ago, when we didn't have, didn't have CBCTs, we'd sound the bone and we'd put our fingers and hold no, knowing where the thickness was. But there's so many um, options now uh, to having this, um, to placing a CBCT. Uh, in your in your practice and making a part, I, I just can't imagine not having a CBCT today um, in in my practice. It just we find so so much uh, other issues that we uh, I think have the responsibility to uh, inform the patient about, and without having a CBCT, we we couldn't do that. So I think it's uh, invaluable. And I don't charge oftentimes for the CBCT because uh, I don't want that to be a barrier for my patients, and so it's it's been very good. Now, uh, so the question here is, can a CBCT always predict bone density? And the answer is no, it cannot. But you get very good over time at, at kind of evaluating the density of bone. 
Um, so you can see it over time how dense bone is. And for example, um, when we teach our course, um, one of the things that uh, we look at when you're looking at a CBCT is the density, of what you think the density of bone is going to be. And oftentimes during surgery, we'll have to evaluate how dense the bone is and guess according to, and I think I showed that implant failure, um, and it showed the density of the bone there. And one of the advantages of seeing what denser bone uh, is actually oftentimes uh, very uh, very difficult to manage because it doesn't respond well to heat. So as you um, as you drill in bone and you overheat bone, it's it's the D1 bone that oftentimes responds very poorly to uh, to overheating, and you'll get uh, failures there. It is. So here's the. If you look at this as far as density of bone, you can see how dense this bone is. And right here, it's hard to tell because of this um, lucency around it, but you can see right here how dense this bone is. This is D1 bone, um, maybe D2, but uh, this is very dense bone. So uh, my business, my, my partner, um, business partner placed this, placed this implant. And when it started having a problem, I, I repaired it for him. Um, but it's typically this D1 bone that uh, has uh, heat problems if you overheat it. So you can start looking at, at implants or at, at bone and begin to determine, okay, how dense is this bone? And you start seeing patterns over time and just by looking at it. So you can't always determine um, uh, what the, uh, predict the bone density, but you can get pretty close. You can predict it, but you, the Hounsfield, um, I get some uh, Hounsfield reports sometimes when I'm doing an all on case. And, uh, and sometimes you laugh because I've never seen, um, I, I was surprised one time when I got a negative, a negative, you know, Hounds, Hounsfield. Well, that, that's not realistic. So we knew it was really soft bone, but uh, it was extremely soft bone, but uh, negative is kind of a, a, over, overstating it. <laughs> Do you have any contraindications, medical conditions of patients such as diabetes or osteoporosis? Yeah, so the course, when we, when we go over the course, one of the first things we talk about is that first thing we looked at before about what is it about the patient's biology that, that reduces their chance of, your chances of success with that implants? And part of them are, are things like this, diabetes. Um, you have uh, osteoporosis that changes everything from a, a more dense bone to a softer bone. And we know that softer the bone, um, the higher the failure rate is. And so as you go down that slide with osteoporosis, you're going to have more failures. They also have um, um, SSRI, SSRIs. You have uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Your, um, there's also your, um, uh, your gastric reflux um, medications as well. Um, that you can take, that you take, that also reduces um, the success rate as well. Um, your uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of patients are taking um, some medications that uh, affect their um, immune system and they suppress their immune system so they won't have as much rheumatoid arthritis um, reactions. And in doing that, you also uh, increase the failure rate of your implants as well. So they found a connection between those as well. So there's a lot of medications, a lot of things that can create um, problems with, uh, with implant placement. Um, so it's not each of them by themselves is not a contraindication, but when you begin to mount multiple of those up, and patients are taking all these medications that all affect um, their uh, their biology. Now you start thinking, okay, do I want to take on this case, and do I do I want to increase my chances of a failure? Um, so you have to look at those, those kind of things as well. Again, one may not be a counterindication, but multiple ones uh, could be. Um, so yeah, good question. Yeah, Prilosec, that surprised me that that uh, can be an issue. Um, you know, Pepsid type of scenario with somebody who has acid reflux. One of the things we ran into as well, as far as having um, uh, problems with patients who have gastric bypass, you wouldn't think, but 
um, what happens to people who have gastric bypass is that over time, uh, in two years, they have a change in um, their uh, acid reflux. And so they have more acid coming up in their mouth and they start having a lot of decay in their mouth. Also at the same time, they aren't absorbing their food the same way and so they are malnutritioned, unfortunately. A lot of them don't go and, and follow the regimen they're supposed to and they end up with, um, with having some uh, malnutrition issues plus the acid reflux dissolving some of the teeth and now they have an increased need for, for implants. Um, places where they've lost their teeth, but they are malnutritioned oftentimes, and so they don't heal the same way as they did when they didn't have the, reef, the, the gastric bypass. So there's another one that, that we found that has been uh, a problem too. Again, not a single contraindication, but mounted with other problems. Again, they're taking acid reflux um, medication as well, which also increases failure rate. Um, they may be smokers as well. They may, so all these things mounting up, you might decide this is not a great case for implants. So good questions. Again, my email, if you have any, any questions, I'll bring that back up here. If you'd like, it's again, DRD at New Smiles. <coughs> and this is a QR code. If you're interested in, in looking at our courses um, and, uh, in Oregon, you're welcome to look at that. Um, I appreciate the time that you guys have, uh, have spent here with us. Hopefully it gives you some things to think about as far as deciding on, on implant systems you want to choose. Um, I, I went through and chose this system um, uh, before I lectured for them. This actually was my, um, my system I used to determine which implant system I wanted to, to work with. So it wasn't reverse. <laughs> I went to this first and then um, uh, chose a lecture for for Implant Direct, so I appreciate their their enthusiasm and having me having me share this with you. So hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully it gave you some things to think about. Um, and any questions or comments? Uh, um, okay. Um, another question was uh, high torque issues. Yes, um, osteonecrosis, especially in the difficulty you have with high torque issues, is with um, dense bone again you have a higher chance of creating higher torque values. Well, now you start um, compressing that bone and you start developing um, uh, a compression necrosis. So I, when you start having high torque values as you're placing it, I always recommend uh, placing all your implants with a torque wrench. They oftentimes you have a ratchet. You don't know uh, how uh, strong or how high torque those values are, but bone is live tissue. And so if you remember that it's live tissue, when you overstress it and keep it under um, constant pressure, when you have high torque values, super high torque values uh, during uh, implant insertion, um, you can create uh, the stress that actually kills the bone. And so they called it uh, compression necro uh, necrosis, where the bone just begins to die um, around those high torque values. So once you get past about 70, um, you need to consider uh, backing that, maybe backing that implant back out, maybe doing um, a cortical bone drill, uh, maybe doing a tap um, in that dense bone. And sometimes I've had situations I've tapped it, I've done a cortical bone drill, but the, the bone is so dense that even placing the implant is still too high. I've had to go through uh, maybe using the next size drill to alleviate some of that bone and not going all the way down with it sometimes, just going part way down to alleviate some of the pressure especially in the cortical, the cortical area um, to reduce my uh, torque uh, value of insertion. So you want it high, you want it 40, 45 is fantastic. Um, getting past 70, uh, you know, get 100. I, I had a situation where um, uh, one of our associates was placing an implant and um, it couldn't be backed out. And so they asked for help and I, I went in there and, and uh, I said, what, what was the torque value? And he said, about 60. And I said, oh, you know, I said, can I have your, your torque wrench? I'm going to see where I, I'm at trying to back it out. And he didn't have a torque wrench, so he didn't place it. He was just estimating uh, what the value was because he did it with a ratchet. Um, I used a ratchet uh, to remove an implant, uh, to remove the implant. I was getting it to 200, um, and the internal portion of the ratchet broke. So we were at 200. <laughs> as a high torque uh, wrench to back out implants. And uh, 
So I always recommend uh, placing your implants with a torque wrench. Um, they, they have them, uh, they're $300. Um, some people like to place their implant um, with the handpiece. I, I do that too. I, I place, I begin placing my implant with a handpiece. I typically put it at 30, um, 30 RPMs and um, uh, 30 uh, Newtons um, for my Newton centimeters for my torque. And then once it gets part way down, I know that that's the, I have at least 30 um, newtons centimeters for my torque, and then I get up, get up my my hand torque wrench, and I'll ratchet it back. I'll ratchet it down further using a, a torque wrench uh, by hand. So again, torque about torque issues are are something to consider when you're placing your implants, and I think it's a very a wise decision to to be aware of what your torque values are. We always record them in our office. We always record every torque value um, for every implant we place. Um, so we, we know where we're at. When we, if we have any issues, we know to, to look at and, and, and how to determine what, uh, what, what uh, troubleshooting might be in the future. So yeah, thanks for that, that good question. When we do, one of the questions again was the, um, this, the bone density, um, it is important that you figure your bone density. I think one of the, when I'm placing implants, um, it's always been like a troubleshooting uh, practice because sometimes the density is not what you think it is when you start placing the implants. But some of our all-on cases, we get a, a full, every implant place has a uh, Hounsfield estimation. It's not for sure, it's just an estimation. It gives you kind of an idea of where it's at. I don't trust the, always trust the, the Hounsfield numbers from the report. Um, how high will you torque the implant direct interactive? Um, I, again, I like, the highest I like to go with any implant is 70. Uh, the nice thing about um, the interactive uh, being a, um, a alloy is that it has higher strength. And so what happens sometimes, because it's also uh, taps as well, so it has the grooves in it to self-tap. So as I'm placing my implant, oftentimes if I get to about 70 and I've, I've got like two millimeters more to go, I can increase that torque to 90 and back it back out. So it's densifying the bone, but it doesn't keep that pressure there the whole time. I densify the bone or it cuts some of the bone and then I bring it forward again, back it back out, bring it forward again. So um, oftentimes, because it is such a strong implant, um, I can use that uh, higher values to place my implant down and be able to um, still um, uh, get my implant in place and back it back out and bring it back down again without worrying about destroying the internal surfaces of the implant. If it was a softer implant, I worry about that because I have, I have flowered, um, commercial for titanium implants, trying to do that technique. And then you pull the whole implant out, toss it away, and get another one. So, yeah. So, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to go higher than 70. If you are higher than 70, it's not the implant that I'm worried about, um, it's the bone. So, you can go higher if you're trying to use that technique where you place the implant a little bit deeper, and then it's a high torque, about you know 90, 100, and then back it back out in order to reduce that stress and then back in again. And you'll see that over time, because it is self-tapping, you'll get reduced um, torque values as you go up and back down again and to the level you want your implant. And you'll have the value you want at 50. If you can't do that, then you need to take the implant out, maybe do some uh, more cortical bone drills or something else, and then place your implant back in again. But I wouldn't, again, um, you can go pretty high with uh, an uh, interactive, but um, again, the smaller the implant, even the 3.0 or 3.2, the 3.0 um, does have a limit too. I mean, you're going to be able to break that as well, but it's uh, higher, much stronger than if it was a commercial for titanium uh, material. Um, when, you play, when you place a bone level implant, do you place a surgical um, a surgical healing cap or a surgical or a suture the tissue over the over necessitating a second surgical procedure. I do both. Um, when you place a bone level implant, do you place a surgical healing cap or suture the tissue over necessitating a second surgical procedure? 
I often do sec two stage procedures. Um, I've, I've run it most, more of my problems I've ever had have been when I've tried to do a one stage um, implant placement where I put the healing, healing abutment on and, um, and the patient is chews on it or something else. And again, that, that three to six week period of time, they, they felt like that they healed, the tissues all healed and they feel like they're in good place and they start chewing on it and they start causing problems. So um, uh, if, I, if I can't truly trust the patient to um, be um, uh, compliant, then I, I will put a healing cap on and do a second stage surgery. So it's, it's safer, just so you know, it's safer to do a two stage approach. And I do it more often because I oftentimes will have the, the more difficult patients that have higher uh, problems. So I uh, end up getting the patients that um, have diabetes or, or smoke and have um, a lot of these other, other problems we talked about that would maybe a contraindication and, and, and I will place those implants but I cover them up. So in the anterior, we'll usually undersize the osteotomy. Um, I, I undersize the osteotomy in any place where the bone is softer. So um, uh, that's how I determine when I place, uh, when I, how I, I under, how much I undersize it is by how dense the bone is. And so uh, there's been times where uh, bone's been so uh, soft, I've done a, a 2.3 drill and placed a 5.0 implant uh, or a 4.3 implant. And because it was so soft, it, it, I, I, I didn't need to drill anymore. Um, I do like Versaburs. I love Versaburs. Um, if you've ever had an experience with Versaburs, those are fantastic for densifying bone. Um, you know, this isn't the forum for that, but um, we do teach that at our courses as well um, because they're so, they're so uh, useful um, to use. So, um, yeah, I undersize uh, osteotomy. I'd rather undersize it and find out it's too tight than to oversize it and wish I had. So, um, I always, I would always encourage anybody to undersize it, place the implant. If it's too tight, you can always increase that diameter of the, of the osteotomy. On um, diabetic patient, what is the torque you recommend? Um, I, I don't have a recommendation for a, a, pa a certain patient, um, but knowing that um, the bone uh, density um, and how, how high the torque value is, Again, anything over 70, I need to start questioning whether it's going to create a problem for that patient. So I will try to keep my torque values around 40 to 40 to 50. That's my sweet spot for, for most of my implants. So um, whether it's diabetic or anybody else. Um, oh, thanks, Derek, appreciate that. Um, all right, yeah. Again, diabetics, uh, it's not a certain torque value. It's just basically keeping the bone healthy and happy in any, in any situation. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had situations where we've placed an implant um, 110. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> that happened to be the patient was fine. Um, but there's other times we placed it at 70 and we had osteonecrosis. So, uh, you know, I try to keep my implant torque value between 40 and 50. You get the 30 sometimes you will be there. Um, if it's if it's below, if it's 30 or below, uh, again, we asked about second stage, two stage surgery versus a one stage. Uh, anything below 30, I would cover and do a two stage surgery. Um, if you're at 45, I do a lot of anterior immediates uh, where we do a prosthetic, uh, non-loaded prosthetic um, at the same time. I, I warn the patient, um, I put the, God, the fear of God in them if I can, um, to make sure they don't chew on that thing uh, while they're um, healing. So um, uh, again, keeping them a, a, a compliant patient is, is very important when you're doing an immediate um, implant placement. Okay, well, I'll be available. I'll look at my emails if you have anything else that anybody wants to ask about. I'll, I'll try to give uh, some good information there as well. Um, I'm, I feel like I can jump over to, to 30 different other, other um, lectures and, and share something, but um, another time.